new artificial intelligence hub in London. Good afternoon. This is uh, Business Live with me, Ian King. I'm afraid we're going to break into the business news, hopefully only momentarily. Uh, there's a press conference going on in Bradford where police are providing an update as they continue to search for a suspect after a mother was stabbed to death while walking with her baby who was in a pram. A warning, there might be flash photography in this press conference. We have a suspect in this investigation who details have been widely circulated and we are doing everything in our power to locate him. We've been overwhelmed with public support and I would like to thank everyone who has so far assisted with our investigation. <clears throat> I will now go through everything we know about Saturday's incident and the steps we have taken since. There will be time for a small number of questions at the end. On Saturday 6th of April, shortly before 3.20pm, Kulsama Akhtar was walking in Bradford City Centre. Kulsama was with her young baby at this time and was walking along Westgate when she was stabbed, attacked and stabbed multiple times. Emergency services were called at 3.21 p.m. However, despite the best efforts of members of the public, ambulance crews and hospital staff, Kulsama sadly lost her life due to the injuries. Her baby is safe and well and was not harmed in this incident. Through initial CCTV inquiries, we identified a suspect, 25-year-old Habiba Masum. Kulsama and Masum are known to each other and are from Oldham in Greater Manchester. On Sunday, we circulate and appeal to locate Masum, who also has links to Burnley and Chester. Masum is a slim Asian man and was last seen wearing a duffel coat with three large horizontal lines of grey tracksuit bottoms and maroon trainers. At 3.30pm on Saturday, he was captured on CCTV getting on a bus on Market Street here in Bradford. He then gets off the bus at 3.42pm on Killing Hall Road and walks in the direction of Bradford Moor Park. This is our last confirmed sighting of him. There has since been no confirmed sightings of Masum. However, I would like to thank again everyone who has been in touch. We have had teams of officers working through all the contacts that we've received and following up on all lines of inquiries. There are significant resources conducting CCTV and house-to-house -house inquiries, and we also have local Bradford officers carrying out increased patrols in the area, which I hope will be of some reassurance to residents. With the support of other forces, we have conducted a number of raids in the Burnley and Oldham and Chester areas in the search for Masum. And during these searches, a 23-year-old man has been arrested on suspicion of assisting an offender and is now in police custody. Our inquiry continues at pace and we remain keen to receive any information which would assist. We are also appealing to any taxi drivers in Bradford who may have picked up my son on Saturday afternoon from the Bradford Moor Park area and it is very likely that he would have paid in cash. If you see my son, please call 999 immediately and I urge people not to approach him, but to instead to contact the police and we can act on any information that is provided. Thank you. Any questions? Assistant Chief Constable, if anyone knows the whereabouts of the son, but they're concerned about their own safety or well-being because they think that that might jeopardise them, what would your appeal to be, be to them? They can contact us on 999 or they can contact Crime Stoppers independently if they want to remain anonymous. From? I don't want to provide that information at this moment in time. Can you tell us if Musum was known to the police before this, and if so, can you elaborate on that, please? Musum um, was known to the police, not in West Yorkshire, and that's as much as I would like to say at this stage. Was the victim known to the police? Had you had any contact with her? Had she been in contact with you? Uh, yes, she had. And what can you tell us about that? Obviously, my uh, inquiries at this moment in time are in relation to the live investigation. I don't want to go into any details outside of that. Would you like to make a direct appeal to Masum himself? I would. I would encourage Masum to contact us and hand himself in immediately. Can you tell us uh, something about the baby and how the baby's doing? The baby, as I said in my statement, the baby was not harmed in this incident as, and is fit and well. Can you tell us the relationship between the suspect and the victim? 
I don't want to go into those details, but what I can say is they are both known to each other. Sorry, sir, do you say the baby, he is fit and well? The baby is fit and well. <coughs> so you can't give us any more? No, I don't want to go into any details. Can you give us an age for the baby? I don't want to go into any details. How concerned are you that the son might have fled the country? At this stage, um, I have, uh, through the lines of inquiries that we've done, we've done an all ports warning, and I believe him to still be in this country at this moment in time. And any eyewitnesses who were at the actual event on Saturday afternoon, what would your message be to them? As we've done in the previous appeal, we would encourage anybody who was in that area who may have seen anything, caught anything on their dash cam footage in vehicles if they were passing, to contact the police immediately and we'll pick up that information and deal with it. And are there any events or incidents prior to this incident that are of concern or relevant to this investigation? All I want to talk about is this investigation at this moment in time. Should the public be worried? My son uh, is obviously, at this moment in time, is a suspect. Uh, we do have a victim who has sadly died, so he is at risk, uh, or is at risk. So I would encourage everybody to contact us and not to approach him. People in Bradford are obviously very concerned right now. Can you tell us about the work that West Yorkshire Police is doing in Bradford City Centre right now? Yeah, as I said, we've got extra officers within Bradford at this moment in time who are conducting house-to-house -house inquiries with regards to the investigation and also conducting sweeps for CCTV with regards to where the last known occasions were. We know the suspects have moved from Oldham to Bradford. Can you tell us about the length of time she was there and the, the reasons behind that move? I, I don't want to go into any of those details at this moment in time. Could you just tell the deceased name for us, please? Yeah, certainly. The deceased is Kulsama, which is K-U-L-S-A-M-A -A -A actor, A-K-T-E-R. K-U-L-S-A-M-A. Say again, sorry. K-U-L-S-A-M-A. K-U-L-S-A-M-A -A and then actor, A-K-T-E-R. How concerned are you about knife crime and the victims of knife crime in West Yorkshire, which is being addressed as one of the key concerns by the Police and Crime Commissioner and the Mayor of West Yorkshire? Work, work is go ongoing with regards to that. We have our Operation Gemlock with regards to the areas that we have concerns about, increased patrols in those areas. But this, this is separate to that. This was um, somebody who was coming to the area for, for a particular reason. Have you had to refer yourselves to any other public police body or anything in relation to anything previous contact you may have had with anyone? Yes, we, we have referred ourselves to the ALPC because we have had co previous contact with the deceased. And could you just give us a final reminder if anyone's got any information what they should do? Please contact the police either on 999 um, or Crime Stoppers if they feel like they don't want to divulge their details. Thank you very much. There we go. That was the latest from uh, the police in Bradford uh, following the uh, fatal stabbing of uh, a woman on Saturday afternoon. More on that story throughout the evening here on Sky News. Now, Microsoft has announced plans for a new artificial intelligence hub in London. The news comes just days after Microsoft hired Mustafa Suleiman, co-founder of the British AI company DeepMind, to be chief executive of its newly formed AI division. The hub, based in Paddington, forms part of Microsoft's recently announced £2.5 billion investment to upskill its UK workforce for the AI era and to build the infrastructure to power the AI economy, including a commitment to bringing 20,000 of the most advanced graphic processors to the UK by 20. 2026. Well, joining me now to talk about this is Madame Ita Mergia. She's the Artificial Intelligence Editor for the Financial Times and author of Code Dependent, Living in the Shadow of AI. Madhu, good to see you this afternoon. Um, how big a deal is this? So I think this is this is a big statement from Microsoft. Um, they've hired Mustafa Suleiman, who is running a company called Inflection, and many of his colleagues as well. Um, and they wanted to show that they're a global power in this. You were, you, they were the first partner of OpenAI, which launched ChatGPT and is their biggest investor too. So coming to London and creating this sort of research hub here, right alongside Google DeepMind, I think is a statement to say that they're very much in the game, leading the game when it comes to AI development and implementation.
Do you think this is going to lead to a bit of a talent tug of war between uh, Google DeepMind and uh, Microsoft AI? Yeah, it's certainly, you know, they're certainly coming into their backyard. But I think the talent issue is is uh, much wider than just Google and Microsoft, right? There aren't that many people in the world who can develop, train these large language models, really the software that underpins ChatGPT and other generative AI software that we're using today. It's a really, really scarce talent. And, we're, you know, all these companies are desperately trying to upskill. Um, so I think, you know, this is going to create, of course, a, a race for talent within these two companies, but also uh, shows the wider issue of the lack of, of talent in this area anywhere in the world. Worth reminding viewers that, uh, I mean, OpenAI, uh, ChatGPT have uh, just opened their first non-US office in London and C3AI have just moved their European headquarters from, from Paris to London. What is it about London that makes it such a magnet for these kind of businesses? You know, I talked about talent being scarce in terms of um, computer scientists who can build language models and generative AI. And London is one of the hubs for this kind of talent. We've got, you know, Microsoft itself had um, its research institute, Microsoft Research in Cambridge for many years. Um, and they were leading some of the work in this area. Um, and we've got, you know, the universities in Cambridge and Oxford and London and DeepMind itself, which Mustafa co-founded back in 2013, has seeded, uh, you know, a huge amount of talent within London as well. So it's, it's really attractive for those who are looking for people with these skills. Obviously, the EU is uh, taking a quite aggressive stance towards uh, AI regulation right now from some of the language that we're, we're hearing uh, out of Brussels just now. Do you think that is a factor as to why London might have a bit of a pull right now? I do think that's true. I think the EU AI Act um, it has been quite aggressive in sort of setting down, uh, setting a stake in the ground for how to regulate AI. In particular, it's looking at these foundation models, as they call it, and trying to find ways to restrict them. Um, so, you know, we've heard from several companies that they are kind of in two minds whether they want to found and have headquarters, European headquarters in the EU, um, and actually find the UK more attractive because the UK government has so far decided not to regulate just yet when it comes to generative AI. OK, Maddie, we've got to leave it there. I'm afraid we're out of time. It's lovely to talk to you this afternoon. Thank you. Thanks for having me. We're going to stay with AI now because when companies want to manage more than one social media account for one of their brands, they're likely to use the services of a business like Hootsuite. Well, today, the company, which styles itself a global leader in social media management, has acquired TalkWalker, an AI-powered cloud service that tracks social media mentions for brands. Well, joining me now is Irina Novoselsky. She's chief executive of Hootsuite. Irina, good to see you this afternoon. Um, what are the benefits of the deal, in your opinion? Um, hi, Aim. Good to see you. From a customer perspective, it's real-time access to actions married to insights. We have over 5 billion people spending almost three hours a day on social media. And the number one problem we hear from all of our customers is how do we attribute business value to the relationships that they're building on social media? And this will help close that gap. So which sort of brands are effectively using uh, social media right now, in your view? Every business. The interesting stat is 99% of businesses are on social media. And if you're doing it right, you should be driving material pipeline from it. And we have ones that are really visible. The consumer brands are the ones that come top of mind. But it's actually all over, whether it's governments, professional services, financial services, healthcare institutions, hospitals are all trying to leverage social media to drive both awareness and revenue. I know you've done a lot of work uh, on uh, into this. What, what makes a customer decide to follow or unfollow a brand on social media? You know, well, one thing that they all have in common is this authenticity related to building a relationship. So 70% of followers will join a brand if they think it's authentic. Uh, another key stat is, are they relevant? Are they talking about the things that a consumer wants to hear? The thing that is most discouraging of following a customer brand is when they're talking all about themselves. One of the things that we talk about at Hootsuite is how do you give nine times before you take once? I mean, I can see why, the, why you've done a deal like this. I'm slightly surprised that Hootsuite didn't have something like this functionality already of its own. 
We did, Ian, like everyone else in the industry, we had some industry standard listening and analytics, but this is game changing. This allows our customers to zoom in and really turn down the noise in social media and really target and personalize their messages. It's also the only tool that is real time in action. And it has its own LLM model, which is really unique that it's not leveraging chat GPT. It's actually an AI engine that's built for social media by social media engineers. It sounds like you're going to have a real sort of granularity uh, here, Arena, but uh, how nervous should social media users be about their data being used and, and sort of looked over in this way? It's a great point. And one of the things that we have spent a lot of time on, as well as the industry, is really around privacy and making sure that data privacy is top priority of not taking any of the data, not using it, not storing it in any way. And so it is our foremost thought of making sure that our end consumer's privacy is the number one concern. All right. Arena, um, just one more before you go. You haven't disclosed a price on this. I just wonder whether you could give me a clue. It is uh, a very attractive deal for both of our companies, and that is all I will share, Ian. All right, Arena, got to leave it there. Appreciate you joining me today. Thank you. Thank you. Reminder of the breaking news this hour. West Yorkshire police say officers investigating the fatal stabbing of a woman in Bradford on Saturday have arrested a 23-year-old man on suspicion of assisting an offender on North of England. Correspondent Shingi Mararike is in Bradford and joins me now. Shingi, what more can you tell us? Well, we can now also name the victim in this attack as Cool Starmer Akhtar. She's 27 years old. And in that press conference, the police also walked us through plenty more detail on what happened on Saturday afternoon. They say that they were called about shortly after 3.20. A woman was walking with her young baby when she was attacked and stabbed multiple times. At 3.21, the emergency services were called and she lost her life due to those injuries. They've also given us a bit more of a timeline on the sightings of the suspect involved in this. Habiba Masoom, a 25-year-old who has links to Oldham, Chester and Burnley. They're saying that at 3.30pm he was captured on CCTV getting a bus. He gets off the bus at 3.42pm and walks in the direction of Bradford, Bradford Moor Park. Since then, there's been no sightings of him and they are now following up all lines of inquiry. That includes CCTV, house-to-house -house searches and more patrols in the area. And like you were saying there, we also now know a 23-year-old man has been arrested on suspicion of assisting and offender and he is in custody so that appeal goes far and wide now that includes asking taxi drivers who picked him up in that Bradford Moor Park area if they'd seen him he is very likely to have paid in cash we also got a bit more detail about the victim's relationship with the suspect we know that they were known to each other but also that she had been in contact with the police they didn't share more detail on just in what way or when that was but we also heard that they 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 had heard from her and, and they are now referring themselves to the IOPC because they've had previous contact with the deceased but the main line here is that they they are renewing their appeal for people with information to come forward they're ask, also asking Masoom to hand himself in as this investigation continues and we now have a name for the victim and also more detail on what happened after the stabbing and their appeal continues. OK, Shingy, thanks for that. Uh, European stocks have finished to the upside this afternoon. The uh, DAX in Germany, the uh, star performer, they're up. Uh, actually, the Mibi Milan's a star performer. The DAX are uh, benefiting today from news of better than expected German industrial production in February. Leading gainers in Europe this afternoon include the French IT consulting firm Atos. So that's finished up 22% in Paris as a rescue draws closer. Here in London, the FTSE 100 has also uh, finished with its head above water, a fairly creditable uh, two-fifths of 1% higher, in fact. At the close, led by some of the mining heavyweights, the leading blue-chip gainer, though, today has been the betting and gaming group Entain. That's risen by 4.5% after the Sunday Times gave takeover speculation and airing yesterday. Another gainer in the FTSE this afternoon to mention is EasyJet, finished up nearly 3.5% higher after it received a push from one of the brokers. Outside the FTSE 100, 2E is up by nearly 3.5%. The tour operator, of course, 
completed the switch of its primary stock listing to Frankfurt today. So I suspect the uh, shareholder register is sort of settling down after a bit of upheaval there. Another one to mention, a company we've had on this programme on more than one occasion in the past, Cake Box, which is the biggest maker of celebration cakes in this land. They finished up uh, some 6% higher. That's after they uh, said this morning that profits for the year would be better than expected. Their sales were up some 9%, I think, uh, due to a combination of factors. Over on Wall Street, all of the main indices have opened to the upside this afternoon. There's the Nasdaq, currently a quarter of 1% higher. Suspect a bit of that might be driven by Tesla, which is currently ahead by some 5%. And that is after Elon Musk, the chief executive, of course, announced it will unveil a new robo-taxi product on the 8th of August. On the foreign exchange markets, pretty quiet uh, just now, although a bit more active than it was this morning. Uh, the US uh, has inflation data out on Wednesday. I think a lot of people sitting on their hands ahead of that. Sterling, nonetheless, up uh, an eighth of 1% or so higher against the US dollar, more or less unchanged against the euro uh, dollar, uh, very much on pause this afternoon. The uh, single currency also ahead against the dollar just now. As for the oil price, well, on Friday, that hit its highest level since the 23rd of October last year. On supply concerns, it's given back some of those gains as the day has gone on. A barrel of Brent crude will currently set you back $90.11 a barrel. That's off nearly one and a fifth percent. Meanwhile, I want to show you the gold price as well. That hit another record high this morning, although it's just uh, given back a few of those gains as the session's gone on. An ounce of gold currently changing hands at uh, $2,327.59. Well, joining me this afternoon is Alex Stewart. She's fund manager at Schroeder's. Alex, great to see you. Um, let's start with the gold price. What's driving yeah. that, do you think? I mean, I think it's, um, you know, as rate expectations are getting, you, you know, cut back for you know, the number of um, cuts we might have this year. Um, and, you know, some concern probably around the CPI on Wednesday. Um, you know, gold can sometimes be seen as an inflation hedge, but would also, you know, can cover you if, if things, that, if the economy is going down. Yeah, I mean, we had those really strong US jobs figures last Friday. We've got the inflation number today. I mean, it feels as though people are now pricing, it, pricing in fewer rate cuts this year from the Fed? Yes, I mean, uh, we were, we were go going in for about three. Uh, it's got now back to two um, and possibly a third. Uh, it's only kind of 50-50 on that now. So, yeah, I mean, bond yields are back up at uh, the highs of the year. Yeah, I mean, I noticed 10-year US Treasuries are, are the highest yield since uh, November last year now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's uh, when we came into the start of the year, people were looking for um, uh, lots of rate cuts, you know, the, more than double than what we've got priced right now. Um, and, you know, with the strength of the economy and, you know, inflation looking a bit sticky, um, you know, maybe we won't even get those. What sort of impact is that going to have on corporate treasurers and, and indeed on CEOs as they think about uh, how they're going to run their business this year and allocate capital? Um, I mean, I guess in terms of their funding levels, you know, they might want to try and fund if they think bond yields might go higher from here. That said, they have backed up quite a lot already. Um, but uh, what we've seen in the past when there's been uncertainty over rates is that they just tend to fund at the shorter end so that they have a bit more optionality. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because we had so much activity in the corporate bond market and particularly January, February of this yeah. year. I mean, it, it feels as though that might have been a bit premature now. Well, I mean, we've got very, very high um, uh, supply uh, coming so far this year and, you know, a lot of banks are rising up expectations now for the rest of the year. But I think that was, you know, partly because, you know, rates were seen as coming down and they were, at the start of the year, much lower. So it was a bit more attractive for companies to, to issue debt. I know you're a bond specialist, but I can't resist asking you, how does this affect the US presidential election later in this year? Because on the one hand, you've got a really strong jobs market, mm. theory, in theory, good news for Joe Biden, and yet, if the Fed doesn't cut interest rates in the way that people think, that's not so good news. I mean, if the reasons for not cutting um, rates is because the economy is quite buoyant and we are seeing a, a bit of a real acceleration of anything, uh, certainly in the manufacturing cycle, um, that's probably a good thing. Um, you know, the, if the rate cuts have to be made, you know, uh, because things are turning down, um, that wouldn't be so good. I mean, we generally do see that if the economy is good, the incumbent um, is in a much stronger position. Interesting. Now, uh, we, it's not the only uh, big uh, macro news this week. We've also got an ECB decision mm. this Thursday. Are you expecting anything at all there? No, I mean, I think uh, it was quite interesting. The German data today was a bit stronger. We've been expecting that for a little while, that there might, you know, this manufacturing pickup does tend to benefit Germany. Um, so they might be a little bit more cautious on when they're going to be cutting rates, but uh, uh, we shall see. 
But I mean, it, if if we'd been having this conversation three months ago, you'd um, we'd have said, who's going to cut first? Will it be mm. the Fed or the ECB? Everyone would have said the Fed. Yeah. It's really not that clear cut anymore. It isn't. I mean, the US economy has been a lot more resilient. We have seen weakness, particularly in the manufacturing cycle in Europe. Um, but with that beginning to turn round, you know, there's probably, you know, there's more expectations probably priced in now for the ECB than the Fed. And in terms of uh, QT, quantitative tightening, mm. how, how much of an influence is that on what uh, central bankers are thinking right now? Because obviously they're the ones who are, who are doing it, if you're the Bank of England or, or the ECB. Is that a sort of a viable alternative to uh, what else is going on right now? Uh, I mean, that's something that they want to get done. You know, they want to continue doing that. And as long as the bond markets are quite happy to take down the paper, you know, which we have been, they've been managing to do it so far. But it has much more of an effect on longer term rates, you know, at the long end of the markets, really, um, you know, what they're trying to do there. We're, in, we're into uh, a conversation here on <laughs> yield curve management, <laughs> if we're not careful, yeah. aren't we? Yeah. And uh, very briefly, uh, what about crypto? I mean, obviously, gold, it's, it's tending to move alongside gold. Well, I mean, that's one of the arguments people have for crypto, is it is a bit like gold in terms of an inflation hedge. Uh, it didn't really behave like that when we did have uh, the big spike in inflation a, a year or so ago. Um, but, yeah, uh, I'm imagining it's the same kind of factors that's driving gold that's affecting that just now. All right, Alex, good to see you, Sever. Got to leave it see there. You. Thank you. Thanks. That's it from me. Coming up next, it's Mark Austin with the News Hour. I'm afraid we won't have a an 11.30 programme tomorrow because the channel will be focusing on the post office inquiry, but I'll hopefully see you this time tomorrow afternoon. Thanks for joining me today. Cheerio.